Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to join you today. It's an honor and a privilege to be able to speak and to share this message. Um, we're going to be looking at the first portion of the life of Moses today. And I'm really just going to take us on a journey through the account of Moses. We're going to be walking through the pages of Scripture, really just the first few chapters of Exodus. And I'm really trusting that God will speak to our hearts and speak to us wherever we are at today through this portion of Scripture and through the, the first part of the life of Moses. So I hope you're expectant. I'm looking forward to sharing and just going through Scripture with you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that we can gather together and hear your word. We really pray that your word would take root in our hearts, Lord God, that it would bear fruit in our lives. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would speak to us, that you would minister to our hearts, that you would feed us, that the bread of life, the bread of your word would be broken today and given to us to make us strong, Lord God, and to help us run the race that is set before each one of us. Lord, I pray that you would fill my heart and my mind and my mouth with your words for your people. Bless us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so today, like I said, the title of my message is One of a Kind, Moses. So we're doing a series of, uh, of messages on different characters in the Bible, and today we're looking at Moses. So where I'm picking up this particular account of Moses is at the beginning of Exodus and just to give a bit of background to the context where we'll be starting our journey today. Um, as you know, the Israelites had come to the land of Egypt and God had actually brought them there that he could use Joseph to preserve the nation of Egypt, to preserve a whole lot of people and um, through, through drought and through famine. And Joseph did that. Joseph was an Israelite. Joseph was a Hebrew man. And God used him to be such a blessing to the nation of, of Egypt and to preserve them through a difficult time. And the, uh, the years had passed and Joseph and all his brothers and that generation died and the Lord was blessing the Israelites in the land of Egypt. They were becoming um, uh, fruitful and multiplying and a new king rose to power and, and this particular king forgot all about Joseph, forgot all about what, uh, what this Hebrew had done for the nation of Egypt and, 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 didn't, and didn't remember that and that's where we pick up the story and I'm going to be picking it up uh, and let me just check the, the exact scriptures for you. Exodus 1 verse 6 to 14. It says, Now Joseph and all of his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, um, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Sounds like the blessing of the Lord. Amen. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. Um, and if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built uh, Python and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. Isn't that interesting? God used the Hebrews to preserve the nation of Egypt and beyond um, to preserve them. And he used Joseph to preserve the Egyptians. At a certain point, the Egyptians forgot all about that and turned on the very people that God had used to be a blessing to them. Isn't that interesting? Why are we surprised when that happens in our lives today? It happened in those times. It's still happening today. And here we see that even in the midst of all that difficulty, God blessed them. The blessing of the Lord brings multiplication. It brings fruitfulness, but it doesn't preclude oppression. It doesn't preclude ruthless resistance. It doesn't preclude unfair and harsh treatment. And that's what we see with the Israelites, with the Hebrew people. God was blessing them. God was multiplying them. God was causing them to be fruitful. And even as he blessed them and the blessing was evident to to the Egyptians and to those around them, so the harsh treatment, so 
so the resistance, so the, uh, the lack of justice toward them increased. And um, so it's a good lesson for us. You know, sometimes when we're walking in the purposes of God, we think, I'm blessed. You know, God is blessing me. Why am I experiencing this? Why am I experiencing unfair treatment? Why am I experiencing these people who, who God, is, God used us to bless them and yet they're turning and they're being they, they're returning evil for good. Why? But we look in, in, at this in the, the beginning of the context of the life of Moses, and there we see it plain, plain as day. You know, often the blessing of the Lord invites envy um, and it invites fear. So if we look at the life of Joseph, we see that the, the blessing and the hand of the Lord on his life invited envy, not from his enemies, invited envy from his brothers, okay? And we look here at the Hebrews and we see that the blessing of the Lord, um, it invited fear from the people around them. And, and you see, when the enemy fears what is upon your life, inevitably resistance follows. When the hand of God is upon our lives, inevitably resistance will follow. If the enemy fears what God wants to cause us to birth, then the resistance and the difficulty and the unfair treatment can sometimes follow. It shouldn't, it shouldn't surprise us. And we read in Exodus 1 verse 15 to 16, it says, The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, When you are helping the Hebrew woman during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, let her live. Shoo, imagine that. If you see it's a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. See, sometimes the blessing and the fruitfulness upon our lives invites an assignment against us okay so here we see an assignment against the hebrew baby boys very very heart rending for the for the moms for the pregnant moms okay sometimes it's an assignment against what we are called to birth and it wouldn't it shouldn't surprise us and you know what sometimes the enemy can try to use our own people our own family our own brothers and sisters in church to come against us and fulfill the assignment whether they are aware of it or whether they're not Okay, in this case, we know that the midwives feared God and they disregarded this particular order. And for some of us, we would have, we would have viewed this as a breakthrough. We would have viewed this as the keeping hand of the Lord upon the lives of our children. And maybe it was, but you know what? When the king saw this, he then increased the intensity of the assignment against God's people. And in, Gen in Exodus 1 verse 22, it says, Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. This is when he saw that the Hebrew midwives were disregarding his um, orders. He says to all his people, to all the Egyptians, every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Every Hebrew boy, you must drown them. Every baby that is born that is a boy, you're going to drown them. I mean, think of that assignment. Imagine, imagine that assignment against your child. Think of it in the spirit realm. Sometimes when God is wanting to use us to birth something and the enemy feels threatened by it, he puts an assignment against the very thing that God is calling us to to birth and think about it how would you have felt then if you were an expecting mom if you were expecting dad at that time and you were fearing for your un unborn child how would you have felt would you have felt abandoned by the lord would you have felt rejected would you have felt alone maybe you would have felt like lord you've used us to bless this nation and look how they're returning this lord god we've been crying out for protection for our babies what are you what are you how are you going to come through maybe you would have felt like god wasn't listening Listening to you and, and, and maybe you would have felt now is not the time to give birth to a baby boy now is not the time to fall pregnant but you know what it was at this point that God was getting ready to bring Moses into the mix you see at this point when the assignment against baby boys being born was at its most intense that is the time when God decided hmm this looks like the perfect time to bring forth a baby boy you see, when God is about to do something, he doesn't, he doesn't necessarily follow our logic. God specializes in bringing forth his deliverers, his deliverance, his answers to our prayers in the least likely of circumstances, in the most impossible of situations, because God doesn't think like we think. He, his logic is not in accordance with our logic. Picking it up from Exodus 2 verse 1. 
About this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi got married. The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She saw that he was special, a special baby, and kept him hidden for three months. Can you see that? About this time, a man and woman from the tribe of Levi. So just when the assignment is most intense, God is saying, Okay, you guys, now's the time to get married. Now's the time. Uh, Moses' mom, now's the time that you're going to fall pregnant with a boy, right? At the height of all of this resistance and this, um, this death um, of, of, the, of the babies. Right about the time when the assignment against the Hebrews and their unborn baby boys was the most intense, that is the time when God decides it's the perfect time to bring forth a baby Hebrew boy who will deliver his people. And he used a Hebrew mom and dad, no army of angels, no extra special protection unit, just a mom and a dad who saw with the eyes of faith, who saw like God sees. Can you imagine their situation? Must have been a very challenging time for them. It says in Hebrews 11 verse 23, by faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw that he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. They saw he was no ordinary child and they were not afraid of the king's edict. I want to ask you today, are you seeing the treasure in those that God has called you to? See, we have to see the treasure in them. They saw there was something special about their child, Moses. I mean, there's something special about every child, right? But they saw something in Moses. God used them to see like he sees. And that, that faith, that seeing something with God's eyes caused them to be outside the matrix of fear. They weren't afraid of the king's edict. You see, the thing that I'm wanting to get across here is could God want to use you to see and to play a role in the formation of a kingdom shaker, of a history maker? An answer to your prayers for your people, an answer to the prayers for your nation. Could God want to use you to bring forth something like that? And if so, we have to see like God sees. We have to see where there's extraordinary even in the midst of of ordinary. See, when we see how God sees and when we operate by faith, the extraordinary can be born. When we see how God sees, when we operate by faith, the extraordinary can be born. The extraordinary can be miraculously preserved even amidst death and destruction when God brings it forth. And all God asks us to do is to see, to walk by faith and to obey, to walk in his purposes. That's what we got to do. Okay, and we see that from Moses' parents. Exodus 2 verse 3. This is Moses' mom. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of uh, a papyrus reeds or papyrus reeds and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. I just want to let that sink in for a bit. I don't know. If we really understood, remember, the king has ordered his people to drown all baby boys in the Nile. And where does she place her baby boy, her three-month-old baby boy? Whose idea do you think that was? Who, which, what mom out there in the, in the natural, with natural wisdom, would take their baby boy of three months old and place it right next to the Nile where they're going to drown all baby boys? It defies logic. Whose idea do you think that was? I, th I, I think I, that was a God idea for, for, for the parents of Moses. Pharaoh had ordered all his people to drown Hebrew babies in the Nile. So that was where God put Moses, the baby Moses. God doesn't uh, do things in accordance with how we think he should. But God always sees ahead. God always makes a way. And that was the place that God needed him. You see, we've got to obey God even when it doesn't make sense, especially when it doesn't make sense. We've got to obey God. You know, I want to speak to us specifically as parents right now. We pray for God to use our children for his purposes. You know, the other day, yesterday, the other day, we were praying um, in our uh, corporate Zoom prayer meetings. We we're praying for our children that God would use them. We pray for them often that God would use them. We ask for his hand to be upon them. We pray multiple scriptures over them. Have you ever wondered what some of the parents of the great men and women 
of God in the Bible must have gone through. Have you ever wondered some of the men and women that God used in the Bible, what their parents must have thought, what they must have felt? Like we, we, we're looking right now at Moses' mom, but, but just take a step back and think for a minute. Imagine the parents of Abraham. Genesis 12 verse 1 to 2, it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Can you imagine Abram? He's going to his parents like, Mom, Dad, the Lord has told me to leave here. I'm going to leave you guys. I'm leaving my family. I'm leaving my support system. I'm leaving every, everything familiar. I'm leaving where, uh, you know, we are, we are blessed. We're happy. We, there's nothing wrong here. I'm leaving here and I'm going. And then mom and dad are like, uh, okay, you're going where, son? He's like, um, I don't know. But God said, I must go to a land. He will show me. And he said, he will make my name great and I will be a blessing. I just have to go, but I don't know where. Can you imagine what his parents must have thought? Okay. But God had spoken to Abraham and God did use him. Okay. Another example. Imagine what Noah's parents went through if they were still, if they were still alive when God told him to build the ark. Can you imagine Noah coming to his mom and dad? Mom, dad, I'm going to build an ark. And they're like, what? It's like, an ark? A what? An ark, it's a type of boat, and it's going to float, and it's going to carry every kind of animal, two of every kind of animal on the planet. And they're like, why? Why on earth would you build an ark? He's like, well, it's going to rain. It's like, what? Rain? But it's never rained. Like, ever. Ever in the history of time, it's never rained. Are you sure that you've heard right? Can you imagine what they, they would have gone through? You know, um, another example, imagine what Hannah went through when, when she had to leave her only son. Then it was her only son, her miracle child for months at a time. She had to give him Well, she said she would give him to the Lord. And she gave him and he served in the temple with Eli and, and he was there with Eli's sons. Can you imagine the heart wrenching um, that she, she could have gone through and having to leave him there and leaving him in the presence of Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, and we know they were wicked. You know, 1 Samuel 2 verse 21 to 22 says, And the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore sons and daughters. Meanwhile, the child Samuel, who was a miracle child, grew before the Lord. And it says in verse 22, Now Eli was very old and he heard everything his sons did to all Israel and how they lay with the woman who assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the meeting. Now, I don't know about you, but I wouldn't want my sons hanging around older, you know, influences on their life who do that type of thing, who do those types of things. But yet Hannah did that and God preserved Samuel and Samuel still uh, fulfilled his purposes. Now, I'm not saying that all of these things are okay. I'm just saying as parents, we have to come to a place where we're willing to trust God. Think about it. Imagine Elizabeth and, and Zachariah, their miracle son, John the Baptist, comes forth, miracle, miracle baby. And he grows up um, and he's the one that God uses to point out the coming Messiah, point out Jesus, you know. Um, and now at a certain point, he gets thrown into prison and he's about to be beheaded. Now, I don't know if Elizabeth and Zechariah were still alive, but imagine what they could have been going through. In Matthew 11, verse 2 to 6, it says, And when John heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to Jesus, Are you the coming one, or do we look for another? Imagine, this is the same John the Baptist who pointed Jesus out to everybody and said, He is the Messiah. He is, you know, the coming one. And now he's saying, Are you the coming one? Why? Because he's completely disillusioned. He's been thrown into prison. He thinks, Surely, if, you know, Jesus was really the coming one, he would come and rescue me. He would do something. And Jesus says to him, says to the disciples, go and tell John all the things which you hear and see. And blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Imagine. And then John was, lost his life. He was beheaded. Can you imagine if his parents were still alive watching all of this? They could have thought, but Lord, but Lord, they didn't understand Imagine Mary, what Mary, the mother of Jesus, went through watching her son die on a cross at the hands of the accusers whom he freely forgave, you know? And can you imagine everything that she must have gone through? So the point is this, that 
God can choose to use our children in such a way and we don't understand it. We can pray and obey God, but at the end of the day, we have to entrust our children to God and trust Him to fulfill His purpose. And now, this is not a message on parenting, but I do want to draw your attention to the fact that Moses had parents that they played a key role in setting him up to fulfill God's purpose on his life. Because if they hadn't put him there, he wouldn't have been seen by Pharaoh's daughter. And maybe he wouldn't have been adopted. And maybe he wouldn't have, his life wouldn't have been preserved. Um, so I'm pretty sure that even as his life did unfold, maybe his parents were disillusioned and were wondering, what on earth have you done, Moses, when Moses kills the Egyptian and Moses flees into the desert when he's 40 years old? Maybe they didn't hear from him for 40 years while he was in the desert. Maybe, maybe from, you know, they, they didn't even know he was still alive. They must have gone through a whole lot of emotions as parents. But you know what? God still used Moses. God, he still fulfilled his purpose. So I suppose I'm just wanting to encourage us as parents to pray for our children and to continue to trust God even when we don't understand the purpose, to continue to obey even when we don't understand what is happening and how God is working out His purpose in the lives of our children. And also to encourage us as spiritual parents and as mentors to see the extraordinary in those around us like Moses' parents did because they saw something and so they did something and they did something in faith and that resulted in the purpose of God being um, coming to fruition in terms of a deliverer for the Hebrews, for the Israelites. So going back to this, the account of Moses, we see Moses um, three months old in a basket on, on the side of, of the Nile River. Exodus 2 verse 4, the baby sister stood at a distance watching to see what would happen. And Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe and she sees the baskets. She sees the basket. And when she opens it, she saw the baby. And the baby boy, that's Moses, was crying. And she felt sorry for him. Now, who do you think put that feeling in her heart of feeling compassion? It's God. Okay, God does it. And because of that, um, she, uh, she, she, does, she wants to protect him. She wants to adopt him. And that's when Moses' sister says... Um, should I go and find one of the Hebrew women to nurse this baby for you? And then the, 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 the princess says, yes. So who orchestrated that whole thing? It was God who orchestrated it all. God who went before and made the path straight. And so basically, she, you know, the baby Moses was taken back. The mom couldn't nurse him. And verse 10, we see when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter who adopted him as her own son who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses, for she explained, I lifted him out of water. That's what Moses means, to draw out of water. So the princess named him Moses and explained, I lifted him out of water. Now, I find that so fascinating about Moses. Even his name has connotations of deliverance. He was delivered out of the very thing that many Hebrew boys, just like him, had been drowned in. So he had to be delivered out of the water that many boys were drowned and killed in. You see, Moses was called to be a deliverer, but he had to be delivered himself before he could be the deliverer that God was sending to his people because his people needed deliverance. But Moses needed to be delivered first. And, the, and God organized that and God did that. We too need deliverance and help. And God often needs to work in our lives before he can use us in the lives of those he is sending to. He's sending us to. And guess what? God uses people. God uses other people. So if someone thinks that they are a self-made man, they are a self-made woman, they don't need anyone, it's just them and God, guess what? You are very mistaken. We all need other people. Moses needed Pharaoh's daughter to adopt him. Moses needed Pharaoh's daughter to lift him out of the water in the same way we need to be delivered. People, God uses people to help us so that we can, in turn, help others. Now, we're going to pick up the story again in Exodus 2 verse 11. So obviously there's a whole chunk of Moses' life that is not recorded. Um, it says, Exodus 2 verse 11, Many years later when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his own people. So that's fast forward many years. 
Moses, grown up, he went out to visit his own people, the Hebrews. So he knew that he was a Hebrew. And he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. Now, I want to ask you a question. Who do you think put that fierce protective instinct in Moses for his people? Who do you think put that instinct to deliver and help his people? Who do you think did that? God, okay? But Moses was trying to fulfill the call of God. He was trying to work out the call of God in his own strength, with his own intellect and how he knew to do. And this is a lesson for us because we cannot try to fulfill the call of God in our lives, in our own strength, in our own intellect, with our own wisdom, with our own plans. It must be God's wisdom. It must be God's way. It must be God's timing, God's plan with God leading the process. You see, the end doesn't justify the means. The end doesn't justify the means. We have to trust God, you know. And I want to ask you a question. What people group has God given you compassion for? Has God given you compassion for young children? Has he given you compassion for teens? What people, what group has God given you a fierce protective instinct for? What group has he given you a compassion for? What group do you feel drawn to? Is it single moms? Is it married couples? Is it men? Is it women? Is it the poor? Is it businessmen? Is it a specific nation, a specific people group? Who has God called you to? Very often that feeling that we get that intense compassion, it's un it's, it's, you can't explain it, that where you feel drawn to, that's often from God. That's an indication of where God is calling you, how, where God is wanting to use you, what he's called you to. And he has a way and he has a plan and he has timing. He knows how he wants to use you and we have to trust him, even if it doesn't make sense. Even if we're putting that baby that is the beginning of the seed of our idea by the Nile where all these others have been killed and destroyed. We have to trust him to lead us. We have to trust him to lead us. Exodus 2 verse 13, picking it up from verse 13. The next day when Moses went out to visit his people again, he saw two Hebrew men fighting. Why are you beating up your friend? Moses said. The man replied, who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me just as you killed that Egyptian yesterday? Then Moses was afraid, thinking everyone knows what I did. And sure enough, Pharaoh heard what had happened and tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in the land of Midian. When Moses arrived in Midian, he sat down. And that's basically where he meets his wife. Uh, and he's given, he, he, takes, um, he takes a Cushite wife, a woman as a wife. And her name is Zipporah. And it says, uh, skipping down to verse 22, it says, after he's married her, it says, Later she gave birth to a son, and Moses named him Gershom, for he explained, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. So we see Moses around maybe 40 years old or so, the king's palace, trying to act out and fulfill God's passion and calling on his life and his own strength and wisdom. And because of that, he ends up sinning. And, and committing murder and having to flee for his life. He goes to the land of Midian and um, gets married there and, and has, a, has a child and names him a name Gershom, which talks about being a foreigner. He says, I have been a foreigner in a foreign land. I just, that really grabbed my heart when I was reading it. Um, when I was reading the account of Moses, it really touches me deeply. You can almost feel Moses' pain here as he's thinking about a name for a child. And those of you who've had children know you really seek God. You really want to name your child something that um, is meaningful for the child, is meaningful for you. You know, maybe it's part of the destiny of your child. Maybe it's, you know, it's significant. And that's what he, that's what he names his child. I've been a foreigner in a foreign land. So I'm going to name this this child Gershom, you know, um, he was a Hebrew brought up in the palace. He was a foreigner, even in the palace. Then he, he knew who he, his people were and he saw them abused and mistreated, but he lived in the palace. It bothered him. He didn't quite fit in at the palace. He knew it. He escapes to the land of Midian. He, marry, he marries a Cushite woman. 
a foreigner in a foreign land. It seemed to be the story of his life, never quite fitting and never quite belonging, never quite feeling like a round plug in a round hole, you know. Um, do you feel like that? Do you ever, have you, do you, have you felt like that your whole life? Or do you feel like that always kind of looking in from the outside? You know what? God uses these types of heart challenges. God uses these things to shape us, to mold us, to, to make us to be how he wants us to be. He is the potter and he makes us and uses these situations for his own glory. You know, in terms of my life, I remember a prophetess prophesying over me once and she said, um, God has used your family to come against you, to teach you that your total dependency must be on me. Do you know how hard that lesson was for me? Do you know how hard that lesson was for my parents, for my family? It was really hard, but God, and, and I'm not going to go into the details of it, but God um, used it to fashion and to shape me, um, to change me at a heart level, to teach me life lessons. Maybe you're going through one of those life lessons right now. Maybe you're coming out of one of those. Maybe you're about to enter one. Maybe you feel like your whole life has been a life lesson like that. Well, I want to say to you, do you know how valuable that is? Do you know how valuable those life lessons are the hardest life lessons are sometimes the most valuable in terms of character formation, in terms of preparation for God's calling. You know, a prayer I've often prayed is this, Lord, please never let the gifting on my life supersede the character to carry it. Because you know what? I don't want to be a statistic at the end of the day. I never want to start strong and not finish or start strong and crash and burn and cause damage to the very kingdom, which is God's kingdom, the very kingdom I've spent the better part of my life dedicated to building. No, these lessons are valuable, even though they are so hard. These lessons help to set us up so that we can run our race and fulfill the calling on our lives because I'm telling you right now the Moses who killed those Hebrew uh, who killed the, that Egyptian and um, had to flee from the palace that Moses was not the same Moses that God appeared to at the burning bush it was a different Moses he'd gone through character formation and he was he was more ripe even though he was more of a broken man. He was more ripe for the purposes of God and to, for God to use him than that strong Hebrew young man who could take it upon himself to kill um, an Egyptian out of vengeance for, for his people. Exodus 2 from verse 23, it says, Years passed. Now Moses has has fled years past and the king of Egypt died but the Israelites continued to groan under the burden of their slavery they cried out for help and their cry rose to God verse 24 and I love this God heard their groaning and remembered his promise to Abraham Isaac and Jacob he looked down on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act verse 24 God heard their groaning and he remembered his promise and he looked down and knew it was time to act I love that God heard their cries God heard their groaning God is aware of where we are at God sees God knows and God responds to our prayers I hope you're praying I hope that you are praying because that is what God responds to he doesn't respond to our pain he doesn't respond to things that we think you know, circumstances. He responds to our prayers. And you know what? God remembers his word and his promises. Come on. He remembers his word. He remembers his promises. He responds to his word and his promises. If there is a promise in scripture that you need to stand on, I, I encourage you to do so. If there is a prophetic word God has given you, I encourage you to stand on it, to wage warfare with it, to be patient and pursue, pursue it before God. God because God is not a man that he should lie. God is faithful to fulfill his word. God hears our prayers and answers. When he, think, when he thinks, when he knows it's time to act, he will respond and act. And we got to just be faithful in that prayer closet. I love Isaiah, verse 55, Isaiah chapter 55, verse 10 to 11. It says, for as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth in bud that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth 
It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. How does God send his word? One of the ways which he, in which he sends his word is when we speak his word. We speak it out. We agree with it. We mix it with faith in our heart, and we release it, and we continue to. We're sending it forth. It shall prosper in the thing for which he sends it. When he speaks it over our lives, it shall prosper in the thing for which he sends it. I love what 1 Timothy 1 verse 18 to 19 says. It's Paul instructing his son in the Lord. He's instructing Timothy and he says, this charge I commit to you, my son Timothy, according to the prophecies made concerning you, that by them you wage war, the wage the good warfare, having faith in a good conscience, which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered shipwreck which some having rejected concerning the faith have suffered ship uh, have suffered shipwreck so we have to wage warfare what is that mixing it with faith believing it having faith being patient allowing god to fulfill his word and not violating our conscience in the process you see moses had the right idea concerning what god wanted to use him and he had the right he had the right gut a uh, sense about it. He knew God was wanting to use him to deliver the Hebrews, but he fought physically and he violated his conscience. We have to fight the fight of faith. We have to wait on the Lord. We have to allow the word of God to come to fruition and to give birth um, to what God has sent it for. Psalm 27 says, I would have lost heart unless I'd believed I'd see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I want to encourage some people today to wait on the Lord, to be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart as you wait on him. You will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, not in the, not in the by and by when you get to heaven. Now, as we wait on the Lord, as we stand on his word, we will see his goodness. Hebrews 6 verse 12 says, Do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises we got to stand in faith and be patient and wait on the lord to fulfill his promises and to fulfill his purposes in and through us amen we must continue to stand on god's word we must persevere and understand that he is shaping us that he is molding us that he is training us that he is making us more like christ like if we will allow him and he will use us for for his purposes and he will use our children for his purposes if we continue in him if we continue in his word and continue to trust him verse 23 it says um I read it just now, but it says, Years passed and the king of Egypt died, but the Israelites continued to groan. They cried out for help. Their cry rose to God. God heard their groaning. He remembered his promise. He looked down, verse 25, on the people of Israel and knew it was time to act. So this is many years after Moses is born. He looks down on the people of Israel at this point and something about this juncture in time makes him come to a point where he's like, it's time to act now. It's time to act now. Can I ask you a question? When God decided to act, was that the time that he caused Moses to be born? No. Moses had already been born. God had already foreseen the situation. He, had, he already knew that everything was going to get a whole lot worse in terms of the oppression of the Hebrews. Maybe the Hebrews had been crying out um, for years for deliverance. They probably had. But the reality is that God saw it was time to act at this point and God had already made provision for himself. He had already provided a deliverer for himself. Moses was already born. Moses Moses was already grown. Moses was already in the backside of the desert, ready to fulfill God's purpose. You see, God knows and sees and really does make provision for his purposes. He really does make provision. You know, when we have prayed, he makes provision for us. And it appears that this answer um, of deliverance was actually in response to their prayer. So prayer was critical in all of this. Prayer is still critical today. You knew that I was going to bring that up. You knew that I was going to say that, right? But but God 
really did make provision. He provided years before for this opportunity in time, for this window in time when he knew that he was going to need a deliverer. And guess what? God's answer for the nation of Israel, God's answer for all of these people, hundreds of thousands, I don't know how many million, I don't know how many there were, but there were lots, okay? God's answer for all of these people was one man. That was his answer. Could it be that God is shaping you as the answer to someone else's prayers? Could it be that God wants to use you to bring freedom and deliverance to a particular group of people? Could it be that God wants to bring breakthrough and help to people through you, that you are the answer to their prayers, that he's shaping you in response to the answer of prayers of people that that maybe you're not even aware of? You see, Moses is a type of Christ. Moses uh, is a deliverer. And God only needs one man to change the course of history. Maybe you are a man like that. Maybe you are a woman like that. Maybe God wants to use you. Maybe the people around you can't see it. But it doesn't matter if God wants to use you. You be faithful to what he's put in your hand. You be faithful to his formation, to his character, to the preparation that he wants to take you through. And God can and will use you if it's in his purposes to do so. Even the least likely of circumstances, God could keep and preserve a young baby boy when they were all being drowned. God can surely use you. Now I want to pick up the account of Moses in Exodus 3 verse 1. It says, Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of the bush. And he looked, this is Moses, he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, Moses said, Here I am. And he said, Do not draw near this place. Take your sandals off, for it's holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Lord said, I've seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry. I know their sorrows. So I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good land, a large land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 9, now, but now therefore the, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I also have seen the oppression which with, the, with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, and I will send you to Pharaoh that I may bring my people out of Egypt. Now, I just want to look at different sections of that particular scripture. I love that portion of scripture where it says that he led the flock to the back of the desert. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire from the midst of the bush. That angel of the Lord, that's the pre-incarnate Christ, by the way. That is, that is the Lord himself. Okay, But the point is this. God knew exactly where Moses was. He was at the backside of the desert and God knew where and how to find him, to send him. God knew, God knows exactly where you are. Don't think that you're hidden, that God doesn't know, that God has lost you, that you're hidden, that your life isn't seen, that God doesn't have sight of you. No, God knew where to find Moses. God knows exactly where to find you. Even if you feel like you're at the backside of a desert and there's no one within sight, no one knows where you are, God knows where you are. It reminds me of the scripture in Psalm 139. Um, Verse 7 to 12, it says, I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning and dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me. Your strength will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. See, there's no darkness too dark that God can't find you. There is no place so remote that he will lose sight of you. God knows where you are at. So there is no darkness too dark that God can't find you, that he doesn't know where you are. There is no place so remote that he will lose sight of you. 
You see, when it is time, God knows where to find you. When it is time, He knows how to locate you and how to get your attention. Look what the Lord says to King David through Nathan the prophet. 2 Samuel 7 verse 8, He says, Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be ruler of, over my people, over Israel. So Nathan, the Lord is speaking to David through Nathan and saying, I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be ruler over my people, over Israel. I took you from the sheepfold. I knew where you were. I took you from being shepherd, from lowly shepherd, the last on the rung in your family. And I took you to be king and ruler over the whole of, of Israel. If God can take a shepherd boy and place him on the throne, if God can take Moses from the backside of the desert and use him to be a deliverer for his people and lead them to the promised land, God can take you. God can take me. God can take us. God knows how to take us and form us and fashion us and put us where we need to be at the right time. He knows how and where to locate us. And I love verse 3 of that portion of scripture in Exodus. Moses says, now there's a burning bush and Moses says, I will turn aside. I'm sure he didn't say that to himself, but that's the translation. I will now turn aside. He probably thought to himself in his language, oh wow, let me have a look. Okay. I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside, God called to him from the midst and said, Moses, could it be that God is waiting on us? Could it be that he is watching our response to what is happening around us to gauge our readiness? Could it be that we've lost our sense of wonder, our childlike curiosity because of the busyness of life? Could it be that he needs us to have time to be curious, that he needs us to have time to watch, to look, to observe, to be fascinated. Okay, could it be because it was when Moses turned aside to look, that's when God spoke to him. That is where God said, I've seen the oppression of my people. Their, their cries have come up to me. I know their sorrows and I've come to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians to bring them into their promised land. You know, if I, when I read Exodus 3 verse 9 to 10, and it speaks of the cry of the children of Israel going up to God and, and the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. You know, when I read that and God responds to that, it's such a vivid picture um, to me of the intensity of the assignment against the lives of God's people. You know, sometimes the assignment can be so intense and our prayers, we've been crying out to God, you know, for help because the assignment from the enemy is so intense and we think, A, we think maybe God um, hasn't heard, maybe God can't see, but he has heard and he can see. But, but I think sometimes God uses the oppression and the difficulties that we go through in life to cause us to cry out for deliverance, to cause us to become so uncomfortable that we're crying out to God to move us on. Because you see, well, well let's be honest, when we are comfortable, when we are content, if God says, come guys, it's time to move on. I'm going to lead you through the desert to a place that I will show you, um, which is your promised land. And the, imagine if the, the Israelites are comfortable in the land of Egypt. They're comfortable. They have what they want. They can eat what they want. All those leeks and onions and, and they're growing fruitful. If they're blessed and they're comfortable, are they really going to cry out and say, God, move us on to our, our promised land? Let it, no, but God used that. God used the, the oppression. God used their circumstances to get them to cry out because God actually wanted to move them on and he wanted their hearts I think he wanted their hearts to to line up so that he could he could move them out because if they were comfortable and he said come guys let's go I don't know if they would have gone I don't know about you I don't know about me but when I look at our lives often when we're comfortable that is when we find it most difficult to move on when something is uncomfortable when there's a, a discomfort a dispeace a, when the grace is lifted concerning something often God uses that situation to cause us to move on and um so yeah that was that it's a picture of such an intense assignment and the the 
Israelites might have felt like, where is God in all of this? But you know what? As I look at that situation, I think God was at the center of it. God was using that to bring them as a people into their promised land. You see, God can use his unfair situation. God can use the assignment of the enemy against us to cause us to come into our promised land because God is God. God can preserve in the midst of death. God can bring forth where it seems impossible. God can use our um, untoward circumstances, our unfair circumstances to give us his promise. Amen. And we look and we see Moses as one of the great men in the Bible, a type of Christ. We see him as a role model, a powerful man. And I just want us to think, take a step back a bit and think a little bit about this. Why did God create a platform for Moses? Um, why did God allow him to lead the people? Why did God um, create such a, such a man in the Bible? Why did he do that? Did he do it because he wanted Moses, he wanted to be glorified in Moses just for Moses' sake, just for his sake? I don't think so. Yes, he was glorified through the life of Moses, but it was much bigger than just Moses. God did it because God loves his people. It wasn't about Moses. It was about God's people. It wasn't about Moses' ministry. It was about the deliverance of God's people and bringing them into their promised land. It was about Moses serving the purposes of God, serving the people of God so that God's purposes could be fulfilled for the nation of Israel. You see, sometimes in the church today, I think we get it the wrong way around. The platforms, the influence, the ministry, the TV ministries, the great name, the fame, so you know, so to speak, these things, it's it's great, you know, but it's all not to fulfill my calling for me. It's not about that. It's not about my name. It's not about my ministry. It's not about me fulfilling what God has put on my life for my sake and for my fulfillment. It's about God's people. It's about God's people that he loves, that he desires to bring into their promised land. It's about his church. It's about the body of Christ. And he loves the body of Christ. And he loves his church. And he raises up ministries for the body of Christ and for his church and for his kingdom. It's not about us. It's not about my name. It's not about my platform. It's about him. It's about his people. It's about what he wants to do for his people and the promised land that he wants to bring his church into. And we need to remember that. And I see that so clearly in the life of Moses. You know, it's interesting that God uses a man so mightily, one man, but it wasn't for that man. It was for the people, you know. It's interesting that God's answer to a nation's prayers for deliverance was one man. God's choice to bring a whole nation into their promised land was one man. God needs one man. God needs a man. God needs a woman. And then he can do the miraculous. You might say to me today, you might say, well, what can I do? I'm not. I'm not this. I'm not that. I don't have this. I don't have that. I don't have the education. I'm not eloquent. I'm not beautiful. I don't have the bank account. I don't, I'm not, I can't. You know what? Moses said the same thing to God. And God's answer to Moses is the same answer that he gives to us today. He says, nevertheless, he doesn't say, no, 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 that's not true. He doesn't, he doesn't disagree with us when we bring up all our reasons why we can't. He doesn't disagree with, with us. His answer is always the same. He says, Nevertheless, I will be with you. We see in Exodus 3 verse 11 to 12 that Moses says to God, but God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Who am I, you know, that I should bring the people of Israel out of Egypt? This is a very different man from that man who was living in the palace and looked and saw an Egyptian killing one of his men and thought, who am I? I'm the one who's going to deliver my people. I'm going to kill this Egyptian. Can you see it's a completely different man? He's come to a point in his character formation and he says to God, who am I that I should go? He can't see it in himself. Who am I? And God says, you know what? I will be with you. When God wants to use us, when God desires to use us, 
God is enough and he will be enough. I'm not saying don't get that education. I'm not saying don't prepare yourself. I'm just saying that the disqualifications that we impose on ourselves never disqualify God. He is always enough. How's God wanting to use you? What has he been laying on your heart? Maybe it's time to ask him to turn aside, to be curious. Maybe it's time to say, okay, God, you will be enough. Use me. Maybe it's time to submit to the plan and the purpose of God. Maybe it's time to say that you don't know how it's going to be fulfilled. Maybe it's time to repent from trying to do it in our own strength and say, Lord, you do it in your wisdom, your way, your plan, your timing. I want you to have your way. Maybe it's time to go back and to pray and to cry out to God. Maybe it's time to stand on the word of God. Maybe it's time to say, Lord, use me to spot the extraordinary around me. Use me to spot those around me that you're wanting to use so that I can play my role in preparing um, the next generation, the next generation's deliverers. Amen. So today we've begun to walk through the pages of the history of Moses' life, just gleaning some of the lessons that we can from the things that happened. And I hope, I really hope and I trust that you have gleaned something. I hope that something jumped out at you. I hope that you've taken something out of this. And um, we could just, we just had time to look at that portion of Moses' life today. And we'll continue looking at his life um, in the weeks to, to come, in the week to come. And we'll see what we can further glean from this great and humble man called Moses. Amen. Thank you for, for listening. And let, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And we pray, Lord, that you would have your way in our lives. We submit to your plan and to your purpose, Lord God. Create in us hearts that are humble, Lord, that submit to your workings. Help us to be those you can use, Lord God, to spot the extraordinary in others. Help us to be those, Lord God, who submit to your plan, your will, your way, your timing. Help us to be those, Lord, who turn aside to look, those who wait on you, those who will listen and hear from you. Would you use us, Lord God, we pray, to establish your kingdom on this earth and to build your kingdom and to strengthen and help your church, Lord, for your glory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.